you. And you're going to need to find the book of Jonah this morning. We're going to start a new sermon series today in your Old Testament in the book of Jonah in the first chapter. And yes, we're going to study the entire book together over four weeks. It's just got four chapters to it, but it seems like everybody knows this story or thinks they do anyway, right? We, you ask anybody on the street, what happened to a guy named Jonah in the Bible and what will they say? A whale ate him, right? I mean, instantly that's what's going to come out. But there's so much more to this story. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's a shame that we've come to think of this as almost a, a, a kid's story, a, you know, a Sunday school or um, VBS sort of story to tell. But boy, are there some lessons for adults in here too. So don't think for a second that uh, that's all there is to this book. In fact, the scripture never even says that it was a whale. Did you know that? Yeah, we're going to look into that in just a second. But as you find Jonah, do you need extra time? Yes. All right. <laughs> Don't start at Genesis. Start at Matthew and go back. <laughs> yeah, it's in all those little books that you need your index to find, right? So leave your marker there and you'll be, you'll be ready next week. All right, Jonah chapter 1. The title of this sermon is Jonah runs from God, and, and that was the entire reason that he ended up in the mess that he found himself in, is he was a, a, a fugitive. <laughs> uh, not, not a fugitive from justice, he was a fugitive from grace. Uh, the Lord had, had asked Jonah to, to do something that Jonah just simply didn't want to do, so he took off. But we've never done anything like that, have we? No. <laughs> Kind of the story of us, honestly, as you read that. You know, I'd invite you to kind of see you in here, and I'm going to see me in here more than I'm going to see Jonah, because yes, I think there are times when all of us are a little reluctant to, to, to take God at his word, and how many of you know that's awfully foolish of us? God always knows best. You, you can't outthink God, and uh, Jonah sure thought that he knew better. So, Jonah 1.1. Let's take a look. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord, <laughs> here's, here's the, the, the counteraction, right? This is the, this is the action and here's the reaction from God. It says, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God. Now notice the little G on there. Okay, we're not talking there about our God. Every man cried out to his God, meaning these guys were from everywhere and they began to cry out to, oh, I don't know, Zeus or whoever. And, and then that wasn't going to do anything, of course. It says every man cried out to his God, little g, and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for what cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. 
Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. And therefore they cried out, look, no, no little G this time, right? They, they gave up crying to those other gods, and it says they cried out to the Lord. And they said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. And it says, now the Lord had prepared, and it doesn't say well, but it, God had prepared, it says, a great fish, it, something big, right, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's already a great story, isn't it? But I'm, I'm telling you, the Lord has a lesson for us and, and several of them here this morning. So before we make another step, let's pray together as the men did on that ship and let's ask the Lord to reveal his heart to us. Father, this morning it is so good to be in your holy house looking out at your people with the word before us here, Father. And as we study the, the book of Jonah, Lord, we, we recognize you as the God who uh, created that tempest that day, the, the God who called Jonah. We, uh, we pray, Father, that everything we say and do in, in this place today would be pleasing to you and that we would be able to open our hearts and receive the lesson that you want to teach us this morning. Father, we love you so very much and we know that these things in the, in the Old Testament and New just reveal your heart more and more and more. So, Father, teach us today, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. So Jonah, it says, decided to run from the presence of God. That is a really dumb idea. Where is God not present? Are you going to get away from him? I mean, David wrote in the Psalms, he said, if I grow wings and fly over the mountains, God's there. He says, if I go to the bottom of the sea, like Jonah's about to do, if I go to the bottom of the sea, God is there too. Where can I hide from your your presence, O Lord. So no, you can't run from God, but it, it does mean that God wanted to do something in Jonah's life. God was communicating with him, which I think most of us really want to communicate with the Lord. Jonah was hearing from him. Uh, God was motivating him and trying to take him on what would have been a, a great adventure. <laughs> and instead, Jonah didn't want that. You know, God has a good plan for your life. God had good plans for Jonah, didn't he? God had good plans for the Ninevites. But you can see here how human stupidity and human unwillingness can sometimes cause things to take a little bit of a detour, right? So God has a plan for your life, but I think there are many times when folks resist the call of God. Uh, simply through ignorance sometimes. Maybe we're just not used to hearing from God, so we miss it. God's asking something of us, and, and, and we dismiss it and say, oh, I, I didn't hear from the Lord. So maybe, maybe that's the case, that sometimes we're just not used to hearing from the Lord. Uh, we fail to recognize the voice of God, but I think more than likely, the reason people run from God is just out and out rebellion. Just rebellion. I do not want to do what God is asking me to do. You know, we, we might become convinced that God is speaking to us in some way or wants something of us, and we are unwilling. And, and, and there are many reasons for that. I think maybe out of fear. Can God sometimes ask you to do things that scare you? Yeah. Actually, sometimes you'll feel like you're walking a tightrope as a Christian. The, the Christian walk will sometimes scare you, but it won't scare you to death. It'll scare you to life. You know what I mean? God, God is always, he's, he's making us uncomfortable sometimes and challenging us to get us over our fears, to get us over that, that hump of life. So, so maybe that's the case is that sometimes we just, we're just afraid of what God wants out of us. Sometimes I think maybe we rebel against God out of laziness. It isn't that we're afraid to do what God has called us to do. We just know it's going to be tough. <laughs> I don't have the energy. I don't have the gumption to do this because what God is asking of me 
is just way bigger than me. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to rebel. Maybe we're resistant simply because we do not like his plan. Did you know that was Jonah's problem? It, it doesn't mention here in the first chapter, but it mentions later on that the reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is he hated those people. Couldn't stand them. They, these were folks who had attacked Israel. You know, th these, th these were enemies. These were, these were terrorists, maybe, is how we would put it. And Jonah said, they don't deserve salvation. I'm not going to go preach to those people because really what God ought to do is blow them up. Sodom and Gomorrah, wipe them off the mat. You know, I, I want to see God destroy that place. <laughs> and God had other plans. God had other plans. So in this case, Jonah's prejudice got in his way. He said, I hate those people. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go preach to them. But I'm, I'm telling you folks, if you run from God, if you run from God, you're only going to make yourself miserable. You'll always regret it. You'll look back at times and you say, you know what? I, I felt God was telling me to do something and I chickened out and now I regret it. I regret it because there's no telling what God wanted, wanted to do in my life. And, and, and what's, what's hilarious about this to me is that God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh, which is in northern Iraq. And from where Jonah was, it was a distance of about 550 miles to the east. So it was going to be a big journey. God was going to be with him, of course, and would see him through. But, you know, the, the Lord says, go to Nineveh. It's 550 miles this way. Tarshish is 2,800 miles the opposite direction. I'm glad you see the humor in that because sometimes the Bible is very understatedly funny. And so God is saying, go over here. It's going to be a 500 mile journey. And Jonah says, no, I'm going 2,800 miles over here instead. <laughs> I mean, he's heading the complete opposite direction and going way out of his way and causing himself even more trouble and harm because he wouldn't do what God had carved out for him. Sound familiar? Oh, okay. We got some runners in here, don't we? It's fugitives. Yeah, I've, I've done that before. I, I'm ashamed of those times when God said, go this direction, go this distance, and I went the opposite direction and way more distance, and all I ended up doing was hurting myself. But the sad part is, you hurt yourself when you run from God, but did you pick up on the fact that in this story, Jonah's rebellion is hurting everybody else around him too? You think there's a lesson in that? That when we run from God, very often there are going to be consequences, not only in ourselves, but in those who are counting on us, on, on those who are in our lives. God sent this storm, and it didn't just rain right on top of Jonah. Everybody was in it because of him. You, you, you see this, don't you? All, all around and all over, that when somebody rebels and flees from God, that's when families can be destroyed. That you, you'll hurt your church. You know, you, you'll, you'll hurt everything around you if you do not do as God says. So Jonah left a place where people knew God and he headed over to, to Tarshish, you know, where God was, was not respected. It was a city of pagans. And in his mind, I'm sure, there would be no trace of the things of God there. I'm just going to get away. <laughs> but again, you will not run from the Lord and be successful. You sense that God wants something of you and you go the opposite way. And most of the time what I see is that when people sort of drift from their faith and backslide, where do they end up? Well, they throw themselves back into the pagan culture around us and get swallowed by it. That's what Jonah was trying to do. He says, I got to get out of all this God talk because it's making me feel bad, and it's shaking me, so I'm going to go someplace where nobody knows him. Nobody talks about him. There is no mention of the Lord, and that's just like somebody leaving church, isn't it? People who bail out of church and say, I'm giving up. Somebody offended me. That preacher didn't shake my hand. I hate him. <laughs> yeah, you, you might chuckle, but... 
People leave churches for reasons way more ridiculous than that. And what they want to do is run from God and go get immersed back into the pagan culture that we are in. And that may be a shocking statement to some of you. you say, Pastor, this is a Christian nation. This isn't a... Ca-. Come on, folks. Do you see the actions and attitudes of the people we have around us? We, we are very much in a ungodly place. But if you run the opposite way, the circumstances in your life are only going to get stormier. You notice in this story that when the storm comes up, it was bad. They worried the ship was going to break apart. And the more this went on, the tempest grew. And the tempest grew. And the tempest grew. And, and you see, you're only going to cause stormy conditions for yourself. In this case, it was a real storm. In your case, it may be a storm of consequences that are going to erupt in your life and get worse and worse. It's kind of like telling a lie and then telling two more to cover that lie and continuing to lie bigger and bigger and bigger to hide the original instead of letting the truth have its day. Sin spirals out of control. And these guys were in a storm of Jonah's own making. But where was he? These guys, they start crying out to their gods. I can almost see them on the deck of that ship, can't you? Yelling out a bunch of mumbo jumbo and where was Jonah? Sleeping in the hold. And, and I, I heard one time from a, from a police officer that if you, if you got a bunch of guys and, and, and you think uh, you know, one of them is, is guilty of, uh, of something, maybe guilty of murder, go into their cell in the morning and see who's asleep. That's the man. Because he knows he's caught and he gets some rest. Jonah was down in the bottom of the boat asleep because he knew he had no, no right, nor did he want to call upon God. He says, I might as well go get some rest because this is game over. Isn't that pitiful? I mean, he's supposed to be a man of God. And instead, he's down there hiding. <laughs> so in his, in his mind, he was probably thinking, what God wants doesn't make any sense. Folks, I'm here to tell you that sometimes God is going to do in your life exactly the opposite of what you have planned. If you're going to call yourself a Christian and say, hey, I, I believe in Jesus, you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready to sometimes allow the Lord to turn your life upside down because he'll do it. How many of you ever had other plans and then here came God and something else went down? But I promise you, God's way is always going to be better. You know, you, you, you might think you know God's thoughts on something, but God's plans for your life will not always make sense. How many people in the Bible did God call and it made zero sense what God, what God asked for them to do? Think of Abraham. Abraham, I want you to take your only son and go up the mountain and sacrifice him up there to me. And God was, was testing the faith of Abraham, but that, that didn't make any sense. And it didn't make any good sense to Jonah that these, these terrorists that he hated, that there was a chance they might, <laughs> there was a chance they might repent. I want to see them dead. I want to see God give them a good stomping like they deserve. But sometimes God will do things completely different than what you expect. God's ways are higher than our ways. Amen, church? God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen? Amen? Get used to the idea. That's where you become a person of faith. As you say, well, I've got one plan, but God says the other, and I'm going to take his way on it. And it always ends up, even though it may be filled with uncertainty, and you may think this doesn't make sense, I know it's of God, but it doesn't, I can't wrap my head around it. It's going to turn out right if God has asked it of you. Does the scripture not tell us time and time again that God has good plans for us? And that for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, that somehow all things are going to work together for good? 
Folks, that, that's, that's the only reason sometimes to get out of bed in the morning, isn't it? Is knowing that what I'm facing this day will somehow work for good because God says it will. That's faith. That's faith. Jonah did not possess that. God knows best. You can always trust that God knows what he's doing and that he's doing right. And some of you may be still trying to maintain control of your own life. How's that working out for you? Trying to control your own life, you're just going to mess it up in the process. Because you'll do it your way and you can't see the big picture like God can. You're in a storm of your own choosing. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy, aren't we? When we run, too, we face discipline from God. And I, I know that may be an uncomfortable thought or an uncomfortable term for, for some, and it may sound harsh, but it's true. Jonah was swallowed by this big fish because he resisted the will of God. So God sent a little, little, little punishment, a little, little kick, a little discipline into his life. And he had to learn as many of us do, the hard way. Y'all ever learn anything the hard way? <laughs> oh, surely not. Oh, man. Yeah, some of us are so hard-headed, the hard way is the only way we tend to learn. Oh, boy. Hi, sister. Me too. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it's the hard way. You know, if, if, you, if you sit here today and you're, you're filled with this overwhelming urge to flee, you can't wait for this sermon to be done so you can get out of here and forget it exists. <laughs> you want to make a run for it? You know, you need to realize today you're not running from a preacher. You're not running from a church. You're not running from the people of the church. You're nervous because God himself is dealing with your heart today. And you feel it. He's, he's, he's rocking you in there. There's a tempest in your own heart. Who do you think wants you to run from God? We've been studying, right? I mean, we, we just had a, a, a sermon series. We, we were talking last week about cutting the head off the snake because he's going to come at you. That is, that is the devil's plan for you is to dislodge you from Grandview, to get you out of the orbit of all these Christian people who might have some way of helping you and enriching your life. He says, flee, get out of there, get away from that place. Lest you hear the truth and repent, that's the last thing that he wants. If you're in rebellion against God, if God has asked you something and you're running, you're going to hurt you. You're going to hurt the people around you. You hurt your family, your friends, Grandview. You're, you're fleeing from God. It doesn't just affect you. It affects your whole world. Don't do it. Don't do it. But what we're going to find out in this study is that God wasn't about to give up on Jonah. It looks rough, doesn't it? Man, God sends a storm and this fish eats him. And oh, man, this is... I mean, it seems like God is, is really pounding on poor Jonah here, but what we're going to find out is that Jonah is a servant of the God who does give second chances. And I praise God for that, don't you? How many times I've needed a second and a third and a hundredth and a thousandth, one more chance to get things right with God, I'm so happy that that's who we worship this morning. When we sing, great is thy faithfulness, that's the one. That's the God who has that redeeming love for us. God isn't about to give up on you either. Even if you're in rebellion in your heart right now, God isn't going to give up on you. See, God has something great in store for your life, but you have to stop running and accept what he's got in store for your life. There is never a wrong time to turn to God. And it is never too late to come back and start again. If you've missed it somewhere, if you rebelled against the will of God, God has not thrown you in the trash. Now he might put you in a storm for a minute. <laughs> And, and, and maybe even prepare a big fish. And, and isn't it funny 
that even in his rebellion, Jonah somehow, everywhere he goes, people turn to God despite his <laughs> you know, isn't that, isn't that neat how even in his rebellion, see, he could have been a part of what God was doing and won these men over on the ship and enjoyed it and felt blessed. But instead, he's always got this sour attitude, even though the people around him, God is doing great things for them. You know, they, they end up pitching him off the ship. And I can just picture that, can't you? These sailors giving him the old heave-ho. <laughs> but beforehand, remember, they prayed. And they said, God, please don't lay this fugitive's blood on our heads because we know it's you that wants him thrown off this boat, okay? <laughs> so so they, they take him and they throw him off and, and, and it's so wonderful what happens. The fish eats him and then the sun comes out. <laughs> and what was the... The reaction, it says in verse 16, <laughs> God ever use you in spite of yourself? It, say, <laughs> it says the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They got on their faces before God. These, the, it, imagine how rough these sailors were too. I mean, these were guys on the, on the edge of society. Some of them may have been outlaws, pirates, you know, guys who are out at sea because they can't be at land anywhere. They're going to get thrown in prison. I imagine they were a pretty rough crew. And it says, the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They said, I served somebody else when I got on this boat. I believed in a different God, but now I have encountered the living God. Jonah could have been on board with that. Instead, he's overboard. And I'm telling you if, you, if you, if you think this part of the story is good, just wait till where we go next. Because you're going to learn some things about big fishes and people who are swallowed by big fishes and the Ninevites and everything else. So stay tuned. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Isaiah, can we close with a song? No matter how much time you've wasted, no matter how many miles you've run in the opposite direction, God says, come home. Only trust him. Hymn 446. Thank you. Let's turn there together and hold on to that page. And I, I think today is more, is, is more about kind of getting things right and making a turnaround. You know, we, we call that repentance when you're going the wrong direction and you, you turn and go the other way instead. If you've been fleeing from God or rebelling against God in some way, during this song here in just a little bit, just, just come back. Just bring your heart back to the Lord. Now, some of you may have never gotten started with, with God. You need to be saved. You need to come to Jesus. You'll have that opportunity too. And it's just this simple. To become a Christian, you must admit that you're a sinner. We're all aware of that, right? That all of us have fallen short of God's glory. But then you must believe in Jesus, and then you confess your sins before him. We do that through prayer, and I'd like to help you with that. So if you're here today and you're lost and you want to be saved, you'll have that moment in just a few. So let's close our eyes just now. And go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will sing. Father, what we have heard this morning from your word just reminds us that sometimes we are rebellious creatures. But Father, you have a way of turning us around. And I want to pray for anyone who's here today, Father, who has been backslidden and going the wrong way. And I pray that just now you'll, you'll, you'll lay down your guns and you'll come back to, come back to where you need to be. It's just that simple. You just, you're like the prodigal son. You just come on home and the father awaits you with good things. Like he's always wanted to give you. And Father, I also want to pray for anyone here who has never accepted your son as Savior. That this would be the day that they have the courage to, to walk that aisle and come meet their pastor and, and pray and receive you. 
And Father, just as you wanted to do good for Jonah, and he didn't want it, very often you have done so much for us that we have not appreciated. And we want to appreciate, of course, first and foremost, dear Lord, the gift of your Son. And so, Father, we, we praise your name. There is none beside you. And as we open up our hearts to you and sing in just a moment, I pray that each of us can sing very honestly, very sincerely before you, that we're going to trust you, that we're going to trust you no matter where we've been, that you forgive. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's do a couple of verses of hymn 446. It's actually 465. 465. <laughs> sure what happened there. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Just make you a little turn. There you go. There, and we'll be ready. 465. There you go. 465. Let us see. <laughs> Please stand back up. <laughs> Friends, uh, please, if you'll look toward the monitors, uh, pray with me, please. Lord, hasten the day when those who seek you in every nation and from every generation will come from the east and the west, from north and south, and sit at table in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> All right, friends, we're going to sing our verse of fellowship, and I'll call on one of you to dismiss us in prayer. So are we ready? Thank you. Here we go. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joy. Amen. Go in peace, dear friends.